Hello, folks, and welcome back to Smart Tech Today. I am so excited because Matthew Casanelli and I have a lot to cover for you. First, we talk about a bunch of new Amazon stuff, including live translation mode for ALEXA, a Pac-Man game for the Echo Show, and so much more. Plus, we talk about Apple Fitness Plus, Apple's new uh, fitness programs, the AirPod Max, which of course came out a while back, and the Logitech Video Doorbell. Then we answer a bunch of questions and of course, round things out with our picks of the week. It's all that and so much more on this episode of Smart Tech Today. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. We know you're focused on security, but are your employees? Well, LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Technology Powers X. Learn how technology and IT departments are reshaping their businesses through an original podcast from Dell Technologies. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. And by Armor Lock. Take control of your data privacy with G Technologies Armor Lock NVMe SSD, that's solid state drive. Never again compromise speed for security. Go to getarmorlock.com to learn more and get yours today. And by Casper. From award winning mattresses to pillows, sheets, and duvets, Casper transforms the way we sleep one snooze at a time. Go to casper.com slash STT and use code STT for $100 off select mattresses. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent, and I am joined across the Internet by the Matthew, the magnificent Casanelli. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Micah. Getting a little clockwise over here with across I the know. internet. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You know, just sort of there there are muscle memory uh, responses that are built in. And oftentimes I will accidentally do the Smart Tech Today uh, <laughs> intro on Tech News Weekly on Thursdays because it's so built in. Um, oh, that's just the way, that's just the way it is. Something will never be the same. I don't remember the actual one. <laughs> ah, you know what? All right, well, let's watch the clock be... and get started. Oh, my God. No, <laughs> I had a better segue. It was, you know what will be the same? Us talking about smart tech news. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Mm. Um, this is the, the first story here. Now, in the notes, Matthew does say we missed this. Um, once, and once. I have to say what we missed was talking about it on the show because I did have this on my device. And at the time, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I completely forgot to talk about it. So we forgot to talk okay. about it. But at least I had have had it for a little while. So I don't know if I was okay. rolled into some sort of beta period with it um, or uh. if you've had a chance to try it. But um, the, I, 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 I always do this. I do long intros for a thing and then I finally get to the thing. And it's just <laughs> sort of the way that I work. But the thing <laughs> is being able to type to A-L-E-X-A, Amazon's virtual assistant. So within the iOS app, there is now the ability to, instead of uh, actually saying out loud what you want to say, you can uh, type it to your assistant. And so in the top left corner of the screen, there's a little keyboard. And if I tap on that little keyboard, um, then I can start to type in uh, a message. And for me, it says, hello, guess who just learned how to type? Message me to tell a joke or turn on the lights or search the app for things like your lists and settings. By the way, typing with me is part of a public preview, so I'm still getting the hang of it. So what I'm going to do is I will type a message to ALEXA just to give this a go and see if it works. Now, I don't have this set up to where you can see what I'm doing, um, but I will sort of relay to you what's going to happen because my 
a tree downstairs. Uh, I celebrate Christmas, and so I have a Christmas tree downstairs, and it is connected to an Amazon smart plug. So I have named that smart plug Christmas tree. So I'm going to type to AliExA right now, turn on the and uh, Christmas tree and see what happens. And AliExA said, okay. And now I will use my living room camera to check if the tree turned on. And it did indeed. So uh, the, the device responded okay. And that happened. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off again because I like to have it... Um, I like to have it turn on after the sun goes down. So I'll just whoop, and turn that off. And as you're typing, it also gives you some suggestions for what you might be wanting to type in. As Thanks. a person who is not big on voice control stuff, actually speaking out loud, I really like this. I think this is, yep. this is cool. That makes sense, especially like that's always been a major problem with the echoes specifically is that they've only been able to be used via their voice and you could use the app and stuff like that. So you didn't necessarily have to be right in front of the speaker. But I always was wondering, like, I think I've said it on the show, what, what is Amazon going to do there? Because the fire phone thing didn't work out. And so putting it into the app and then now letting you type into the app makes a lot of sense. They used to have this, like they, you can just type in shortcuts and, run them from Spotlight, but they used to have a specific Ask Siri thing down at the bottom, and I think that kind of went away in iOS 14. I should look into that again, because that was pretty convenient. But I think yeah, people have been calling for like a, a whole messages interface with Siri, so you could actually see the conversation history too, which would be nice. I would love that, because yeah, right now what you have to do is you go, you launch the settings app, you go into accessibility, you tap on Siri, which is all the way down at the bottom, and then up at the top of that section is uh, type to Siri toggle. And so you turn that on, and it says Siri will listen for voice input when you press and hold the top button. But otherwise, and the, the, uh, this is on an iPad, so the iPad has a top button. On your iPhone, it would be the side button. Um, so typing to Siri would be the way that you communicate with Siri. And then if you want to talk to Siri with just your with your voice, you press and hold that button to actually launch Siri. So it, the thing is, it disables some of the functionality and ease of use of Siri if you are used to talking to it. Um, yeah. Whereas but, with... Go ahead. I was going to say, last year, they literally had an Ask Siri button in Spotlight that worked different than the uh, oh, type to I Siri see. thing. Yeah, oh, it was, I'm, I was like, I knew I wrote an article about this. So I just Googled myself to confirm it. And yeah, there's a, there's a piece from iMore that's like how to ask Siri and spotlight to type to your assistant because oh. it, it used to be down at the bottom where you can search the app store and stuff. And it's just, it's just gone. I don't know. Maybe just nobody used it, but also it's one of those things where I feel like I was the only person who discovered it and wrote about it and then they got rid of it. So it was like, if you guys make this more prominent or something like that, people would use it. I want to tweet about that. That is like, why'd you take this away? <laughs> I don't think I yeah. even noticed. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about that. Now. Which is probably, I guess that's maybe why they did it. Um, you know, I checked the calendar and it's not April 1st <laughs> yet. Uh, there is a developer who has launched an, uh, an app. Uh, this was created by a former ALEXA engineer who has uh, created an app called Meow Talk. Um, and this, <laughs> say what? Oh, I'm just laughing. <laughs> oh, and this app um, is, is uh, supposed to identify the meaning of meows. Um, it's so so it says research suggests that unlike their human servants cats do not share a language each cat's meow is unique and tailored to its owner with some more vocal than others so instead of a generic database for cat sounds the app's translation differs with each individual profile by recording and labeling sounds the artificial intelligence and machine learning software can better understand each individual cat's voice the more it's used the more accurate it can become the eventual aim is to develop a smart collar 
uh, so that you could know without actually having to hold up the app to do it, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so I'm guessing you don't. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I like their explanation because to me it totally makes sense. Um, I included this because my cat has recently started meowing and never did in the past. Oh, really? Um, and yeah, because we switched him to wet food. And so he starts to get hungry at different times and also basically can't feed himself. So, I mean, who knows how long this will last by the end of lockdown. Um, but it's basically at seven in the morning every single day he starts to meow. And so, and it's a pretty particular meow too. That's like, he's only done it and it's a feed me type of thing. And so I totally just want to try this and see how much he actually it like is just like, oh, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And I don't know, even receiving a text for it. Is that kind of sounds funny. So <laughs> I think well, it's interesting. I am tasking you with following up on that for sure, because I am curious to hear if it um, if it works and if there's any sort of accuracy to it. Although it sounds to me like your cat's meows are almost exclusively related to feed me and nothing else. Um, um, he does occasion like he does have just like the cute little chirps and stuff like that. But I think what I mean, I don't see how this wouldn't work because it's trained off of your own cat's data. And so I think that's the part that was interesting is it's like they're not going to you can't make a database and translate what cats are saying. But if you over time understand how the cat is responding and you're training the thing as it goes, I think it makes sense. It's kind of like actually intelligent and not some like fake intelligence that they just apply for everybody. So it's like machine learning for yourself and your own pet. And I think sometimes it's important because I mean, it's not, I don't know if this app will solve the problem for you, but just understanding your animal's behavior and if something changes is always hard to understand. So maybe if you keep this on over time, it's like, Hey, just so you know, they're not meowing as much or something like that or way more now or, that stuff can be pretty important to identify early on what's going wrong with your animal because otherwise they just get sick and you don't even know. Yikes. Well, uh, call me when you get Bark Talk, please, because <laughs> I will definitely be downloading exactly. that. Or Wolf Talk, maybe. Woof. Um, up That's next. my favorite kind of smart tech, though, is where it, it seems silly, but it's like, actually, this could be useful and they're not charging $150 for it or something like that. So Right. No so, harm. Yeah. No harm, no foul. Um, wait, that's those are those yeah. are birds. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. This is you know Amazon's uh, trying to get better about languages in general, and there are two stories that have come out of uh, you know this improvement to Alexa's language abilities, and one of those is uh, the ability to kind of switch between languages. Um, in order to communicate more effectively. So um, this means that you can kind of automatically switch between languages. Um, so you could uh, respond, or excuse me, Alexa would respond to requests in English um, and one other language that you could kind of choose. But um, now more languages are available. So it can speak in German, French, Canadian French, Japanese, Spanish, U.S. Spanish, and Hindi. And of course, those can be paired with English. Um, so you can you will be able to use both of those at the same time. And the idea there is that, you know, you may be bilingual and want to be able to communicate uh, in those two languages. Uh, cat has not been added, uh, sadly. <laughs> exactly. The was... other one is that instead of having to actually pull up the app to say, okay, now I want you to speak to me in Spanish or I want you to speak to me in Hindi, um, you can just speak it out loud and say, A-L-E-X-A, speak Spanish. Um, and that will set a primary language. And then if you want to do that switching between the two, that pairing, uh, you can say speak Spanish and English, for example. Um, and then this is this is directly from The Verge's article uh, to talk about what are called latent goals. Uh, Alexa can address requests that are hidden within or naturally follow an original question. So this is really powerful. Uh, here's the example. If you ask, how long does it take to steep tea? 
ALEXA can assume that, of course, the latent goal is setting a tea timer and respond, five minutes is a good place to start and say, would you like me to set a timer for five minutes? So instead of just answering the question, it takes a part, it, it takes your, your request, your question in this case, and it goes, okay, here's the question that they're asking. We'll answer that. But also, if what they're eventually trying to get to, that latent goal, is setting a timer for their tea, then let's go ahead and offer that ability. So you might say, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of one that uh, another one that makes sense. I, I guess it would be, um, you know, what what should I heat? Uh, <laughs> roasted chicken, what temperature yeah. should I heat roasted chicken to? And then since I've got an Amazon smart oven, then it could say, I, you know, it would say, um, 375 degrees. That's too much. D just bear with me. 165 degrees. And would you like me to set the smart oven for roasting or something like that? Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That is, yeah. I, I think we can't, <laughs> look at that. I, we can't look at that and just sort of go, oh, that's cool. Because that is huge when it comes to uh, s sort of taking a step into creating a truly useful and a truly intelligent smart assistant that is actually helpful beyond just answering questions or doing uh, on off kind of tasks. So celebrate good times come on. I think this is very cool <laughs> um, as an addition to AliExa's abilities. Yeah, I agree. Those are that's definitely actually intelligent, which is neat. And the translation thing, I, I, that definitely came across my radar just because Federico, Federico Vitici of Mac Stories posted it, and he lives in Italy, speaks fluent Italian, and tr switches in between English. And he was like, "Wow, this is seamless. It's like you can just change languages, and it will understand." So good, good updates there. Oh yeah, and there's yes. like Fire TV into the routines too. So I'm totally stealing this one, but it says I'm grabbing a drink and it will pause your TV show and turn on your kitchen lights. I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm totally making that shortcut because it's like I didn't get something from the kitchen. Yeah. And then <laughs> Alex, say, I'm back. And then it you know resumes your show yeah. um, or it checks if the television is paused. And if the television is paused, then it will hit play or something like that. Um, oh, if this, then that fun mm -hmm. functionality. And I don't even mean the actual service. I just mean conditionals. Sort of, yeah. Con thank you. Uh, conditionals. Very good. <laughs> I like how we I'm both sorry. went into the nerd ones. <laughs> we totally did. Uh, love you, nerds. Um, uh, the other thing, language wise is uh, live translation is live translation mode for <laughs> AliExa. Uh, this is a, a brand new feature that lets people have conversations in two different languages uh, using speech recognition and, of course, machine learning. Um, this lets you have a conversation where you are talking out loud and it translates for the one person and then they are talking out loud and it translates back uh, to the other person. So um, this says the command A-L-E-X-A translate French will translate between Eng English and French um, and then A-L-E-X-A stop will of course end the translation session. So you could, for example, you know, my Spanish friend comes over, A-L-E-X-A translate Spanish and I say in English, um, how are you today? I'm so glad to see you're wearing a mask since in this very fake uh, situation that I have created, <laughs> you are in my house for some reason. And then ALEXA will attempt to translate that sentence or sentences for my uh, imaginary Spanish friend. And then they will speak back to me in Spanish and it will translate to English for me. So that's a really cool feature. Um I think it, it <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, I think it's especially helpful. I'm trying to think of the situations where this makes the most sense because yeah, you would okay, kind of have to have for sure. My, um, I have a bunch of, I have 200 relatives in France. My Whoa. grandfather on my mom's side was the oldest of ten, and so they're I'll just say they're Catholic also, so they all had lots of kids. Um, gotcha, gotcha. But, yeah. Part of it is that when they come visit, we'll regularly have, I mean, not recently, but regularly have 
family come visit and it's basically like I can't speak to the older generation of people who comes because I don't speak any French, they don't speak any English. And so like literally we'll have like another cousin there to basically be their translator also. And so now they basically, they like wouldn't need that or you could sit there and have a conversation one-on-one without needing anyone nearby. And I like that and not like into your phone too, which is still also just as cool, but just kind of sitting there casually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, be neat. I'd love to have a conversation with one of my great aunts and uncles and I, I could with stuff like this. So I'd like to try it if I could. That's cool. <laughs> um, tell me about Waka Waka. <laughs> <laughs> this one is silly and I don't even understand how it works, but you can play Pac-Man on the Echo Show now and the Fire TV and supposedly use your voice to get him to turn left and right. So <laughs> this is definitely <laughs> one of those things that's like, you'll have to use Waka knees is what they say. And so Waka means right and Waki means left. And I, <laughs> I don't even well, know what to up say. And down. Yeah, it's exactly. I mean, you, the, I'm assuming it's there's some the onboarding, but you'll yeah. be this. I mean, it, walk, I think walk, it sounds walk, walk, walk. like one of those. <laughs> yeah, it walk. sounds like one of those fun viral things so that you just make a video of because you're like, waka, 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 wiki, wiki, waka. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but this is just a clever extend, extension of the gaming stuff coming to smart displays over time. I mean, I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could see this coming to other platforms. It's like if we already have all the mics to control all the stuff anyways, why not have some fun voice experiences and combined with the controller type things? But this does seem sort of like a headline partnership type of thing and not something that most people are going to do. But hey, if you want to be Pac-Man, you can get it. And I have a whole subscription to the Waka Club. So <laughs> new work. <laughs> Waka flock of flame. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Pac-Man that part's for a little ridiculous. Voice. Yeah, it, it's like it, it's a seven dollars <laughs> a month subscription for Waka Waka. Why, why not? They they never stopped to think. Why should we? <laughs> uh, all right, Waka Waka. Um, let us see here. Oh, um, Senator Klobuchar. Sp- Spooked by the halo has said, hey, um, we're going to need some new health tracker privacy protections in place because, yeah, I, I don't know if you remember the halo, but it's the one that does all of the normal fitness trackery stuff, but then also tracks your voice. Um, and uses your conversations to try and determine your emotions, um, to try and figure out what your emotions are. A very, very odd app a uh, very odd device rather yeah. um oh yeah and i forgot it does 3d body scans too um yeah <laughs> it is it's just like obviously this is a pretty wild product and could have some health benefits or something but like i think it is very clear even to people in the highest levels of government maybe somebody like amazon shouldn't be the company that's doing all of this in a way that is also just like, what are they doing with that information? And so I think it's not always great to get to the point where the government has to get involved because we're doing the tech com- tech world is doing such stuff that is out there and not built with this stuff in mind and from the beginning, or maybe Amazon does have it, but just uh, their priorities are different. So it's, it's, it's but on some level it's good to see because like who who else can stop Amazon like nobody so they're gonna do it anyways otherwise so I don't know I'm not necessarily say like advocating for that but it's just worth acknowledging that this product seems to have crossed that line enough to attract the attention uh, at the highest levels so it's, yeah, yeah. And even still, just the optics of this year and everything, it's like, what? What We were like, what are you doing, Amazon? And it's just like, I think the same thing, just like with Pac-Man being a voice. It's like, probably shouldn't just do this because you can. Like, think about the overall impact. So, 
<laughs> yeah, and and I think that this is good here that there's sort of questions about okay, look, you know, you're the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and it's your job to make sure that these uh, that these companies are protecting people's privacy when they are gathering so much information, and so that is kind of what um, Klobuchar was intending uh, to do: is say, hey, look, this is what this does. Um, and there's good stuff about this, sure, but here are the questions that were asked. What actions is the Department of Health and Human Services taking to ensure that fitness trackers uh, uh, safeguard users' private health information? What authority does HHS have to ensure the security and privacy of consumer data? Uh, are additional regulations required to help strengthen privacy and security protections? Why or why not? And please describe in detail what additional authority or resources that the HHS could use to help ensure the security and protection of consumer health data obtained through health tracking devices like the Halo. This is fantastic, yeah, um, exactly. in, in my opinion, um, because I think that not only does it... Um, well, there are like there, there are multiple things here. One, we've got a uh, lawmaker who actually is paying attention to uh, technology, <laughs> yeah. which is a huge thing. Um, then we have people saying, "Look, this is this is a this is a big kind of gathering practice. Let's look more into this." And then also kind of trying to get the current state of things and the potential future of things. All mm -hmm. that wrapped up into one. I think that that's uh, very good. So I am, for one, happy that um, Klobuchar sent this and is, you know, interested in, in making sure that things are above board here. Yeah, I like that. Especially it's just like that's the job is to check on whether or not. It's like I like that it's not coming from a place of like you're you're doing this wrong and you need to change it that some politicians come towards with tech companies. It's like, please explain in detail what's going on and then we'll go forward from there, which I think makes a lot of sense. Agreed. Okay. Let us take a quick break because I want to tell you about the incredible, the excellent, the awesome technology powers X, uh, which is bringing you this episode of smart tech today. It's an original podcast by Dell Technologies. Each episode of Technology Powers X focuses on a different industry and goes behind the scenes to help you understand how technology and IT departments are reshaping their businesses through AI, cloud, edge, intelligent devices, and more. Uh, I was able to get a sneak peek of Technology Powers X, but the season is out now, so you can absolutely check it out yourself. There was one episode that was about theme parks. Super cool to hear how they use sensors and massive amounts of data and software to make rides safer, more efficient, and of course, make everything fun. Uh, there's an episode that talks about vertical farming and how innovative new tech can change where our food comes from and how this may be the future of sustainably feeding 21st century populations. Instead of spreading out, 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 you go up, 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 and down, 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 which is very cool. Uh, Technology Powers X is hosted by Danielle Applestone, who's a hardware engineer and entrepreneur. Uh, and very exciting for you, we have a clip from the episode, The Beer You Love. Today at New Belgium, the ancient craft of brewing has an indispensable 21st century ingredient, hyperconverged infrastructure. That infrastructure supports almost every aspect of planning, marketing, sales, and distribution. Uh, now the title hopefully makes sense to you. Technology powers X, you solve for X, and in this case it was technology powers beer with hyper-converged infrastructure. You can listen to the whole episode to learn all about how technology powers beer at the New Belgium Brewing Company. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere. You listen to podcasts and download each episode today. That's Technology Powers X. Download it today. My thanks, our thanks, in fact, to Technology Powers X for its support of Smart Tech Today. All righty. Uh, this is a report of the newly launched, the very new and the super exciting Apple Fitness Plus. 
um, which I have been sort of updating my devices to uh, take advantage of, of across different devices. And of course, Apple Fitness Plus is Apple's uh, subscription fitness service where the company has um, hired coaches to lead folks through different types of workouts, uh, cycling, uh, high intensity interval training, strength and yoga. Oh, and dance as well. Um, so you can watch these guided videos from your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV. And the whole time your Apple Watch tracks your uh, performance and sort of helps keep that information uh, so that you can sort of get an overall picture of your health and mm. your you know, heart rate and stuff like that. Um, so this this interview with Fast Company um, was Apple's Jay Blonick, who is the company's head of fitness. Um, and so he kind of explains the Apple Watch um, and Apple Fitness Plus integration and what the idea is with Apple Fitness Plus. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that Fast Company article is well worth a read, but um, 9 to 5 Mac kind of has a little bit of a summary of what's going on there. Um, have you downloaded this yet? Have you turned it on yet? I have not yet. It just came out right before the show started. And I was, I always, I'm like on betas, but then I have to get off of them and right. all that. Um, but I also just didn't want to be sweaty for the podcast mostly. Um, but I was watching, I Justine had an early look video at it and it looks pretty interesting. Um, I definitely, I saw a great tweet that was like, anybody else not working out because Fitness Plus isn't out yet and they're just waiting for it? Like, like <laughs> oh, I shouldn't work out because, you know, that's not out yet. Um, so now I no longer have that excuse. But some little details that I liked, um, there's always three people doing the class in that there's like the instructor and then another person and then somebody doing like a modified basic version of that exercise so that maybe you're not a fitness instructor and can't do a complete deep lunge or something like that all the way down. And there's somebody doing like the simpler version. So you can kind of try it out without hurting yourself essentially. Um, and some other things like I think all the instructors learn sign language so that they give like a 30 second intro and then they, they like sign that it's time to start. And so anybody who's just watching can see it, but it's also accessible by default, which is cool. So that's, a great example of accessibility just benefiting everybody and it also makes the experience great for those kinds of people who need it. Um, and then um, even some other things like the 9 to 5 Mac article is saying if you're always doing like this type of workout that's just like you're always moving in one direction, it will suggest a different workout so that you can move your body in different ways and things like that. Oh, so that's and it works neat. from um, iPad, iPhone, and Apple TV, but I think it is, I'm curious if anybody's just not going to realize it requires an Apple watch like it, it does kind of make sense, but it is an interesting service specifically on top of the Apple watch that we haven't really seen before. So who knows, maybe it'll sell more of those, but I've got it in the whole Apple one subscription, which is I think smart for if you're a big Apple nerd, cause you probably already paying for all those things separately. Exactly. And then it's, yeah. it's not like, oh, I need to decide whether or not I want to work out this month. It's like, it's always there. So, <laughs> And if you've got uh, family sharing set up, then it will also be available for any of your, you know, household who is part of your family sharing service or, you know, family members who are part of your family sharing service. So um, this, it'll be interesting for me because my partner and I just started using Superhuman, which is the um, AR the, or not the AR, the virtual reality workout thing that's available on Oculus Quest 2 and oh, different nice. virtual reality stuff. Um, it's a lot like Beat Saber, a lot, a lot like Beat Saber, but it's, um, it's, it's, be, it's not a game. Like it's meant for fitness. And so there are things about mm -hmm. it that are much better in terms of if you're wanting to work out, uh, this app helps you with that. And, um, my goodness, it kicks your butt. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and so it'll, what I, what I say, it'll be interesting, uh, to see, it'll be interesting to see if I choose to use Apple fitness plus or 
superhuman more often um, because superhuman also has uh, by way of Apple health integrations, it can live track your heart rate and show it to you in virtual reality while you're doing your workouts and stuff. So um, there are some similar tie-ins to what cool. uh, Apple Fitness Plus offers. Plus it's in VR, um, which means that you can be in these different locations and stuff, which is a lot of fun. Um, yes, you're right, uh, Kevin. It's called Supernatural, not Superhuman. Um, Supernatural uh, okay. is the name of the the app for Oculus Quest 2 that I've been using. Um, it is a subscription service. Uh, and so you, after a, I think it's like a month trial, then you pay eight bucks a month or something like that. Um, but it's cool because you get a, they send you a silicone band thingy for the oculus so that you don't sweat through the pad mm. <laughs> um and yeah the the fitness version looks a lot like beat saber you'll see but um they also have meditation and i think stretching are the other ones that are in there so yeah there are several different ones um and it's very cool um i'm enjoying that but i'm looking forward to trying out fitness plus uh to nice. see if that ends up being the one that I'm sticking with, because there's a lot more offered by Fitness Plus, and I'm looking forward to trying these dance ones, these dance. Uh, yeah, I'm. A, I am too. Like, especially because it integrates with your real music or real Apple Music and stuff like that. That mm -hmm. seems pretty interesting. But the VR thing sounds cool too. I didn't know it worked with your watch, so maybe I'll have to try that. Yeah, you should. You get 30 day free trial. You might as well, and you Thanks. might end up like we did afterward, where. Our legs were hurting so much. <laughs> I'm still a little bit in pain, um, but it's good pain. Uh, iOS 14.3, uh, as we, I think we mentioned this on the show. Was it this mm -hmm. show or was this a different different show? Sure, it was Oh, <laughs> you're just saying that it's out now. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so I've got a newsletter out on the latest update because I mentioned it before, but the whole custom themes icon trend for iOS 14 has basically been blessed by Apple and shortcuts now just open into the app if you click on it from there. So before it would have this whole workaround thing and I'm pretty sure most people found it not worth it, which is definitely the case for me, but now shortcuts can be added to the home screen and if they open the app, we'll just open, you can run all your scripting stuff. It's very cool. Um, I have a YouTube video that's still in the works, but I I did the thing and I put all a thousand of my shortcuts um, on my home screen, <laughs> on my phone and my iPad. So it's pretty wild, but it's taken me a bit to share it because it's just so much. Um, but it's so there's also the set wallpaper action is now officially part of shortcuts. And so you can have automations that change your background at any time things like that. That's very cool. Um, so there's a lot of ways to customize your home screen in addition to the widgets now that I feel like this should have been the iOS 14 launch, but it's so cool. Oh yeah. I've got a Reddit link too, to somebody just had it, that back tap accessibility feature. You could have it. So you just double tap your phone and then the background changes immediately, which is pretty cool. Um, yes. AirPods max are here. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, the $999,999 <laughs> pair of headphones. Uh, no, these are very expensive, um, headphones that, you know, we talked, so, so we talked about these on iOS today. We talked about these on Mac break weekly. So you can go watch those shows if you want to see sort of yeah. an in-depth uh, review and understanding of how these works, but these work, but think about much of the technology that's baked into AirPods pro, but in an over the heat, over the ear headphones version, um, there is an H one chip in each of the uh, drivers. So you get that, uh, computational audio in both headsets. I think it's what, what how many cores? Let's see. I've got to look up core. Oh, yeah. Isn't it like 10 eight, audio eight, cores yeah. in each okay. of the headphone, uh, cups. And so that's 9 billion operations per second. It can do for yeah. adaptive EQ, active noise cancellation, transparency mode, and spatial audio. Um, all of these features are available. It is, here's the thing. Um, I think Renee Ritchie put it very well. So these are expensive. 
um, headphones, but they're five hundred forty nine dollars. Yeah, uh, which Plus is tax. very expensive. But for what they are, they are priced at similar levels to headphones that offer um, the same acoustic ability. You can spend thousands of dollars on headphones. You can spend tens of thousands of dollars on headphones and the surrounding hardware. Um, and so headphones of you know superb quality can cost a whole heck of a lot of money. But most people, and this is the you know the thing that Renee was kind of touching on, most people are familiar with what they see as the upper end of headphones, which is like the ones that I have on the Sony WHM blah 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 mm -hmm. blah, uh, <laughs> three hundred some dollars, uh, upper two yeah. hundreds to three hundred dollar headphones are what people are thinking of when they think of uh, more expensive headphones, and. Apple as what we consider an affordable luxury brand. Um, creating a pair of headphones that's outside of that affordable part and is just that luxury part, these start to feel more... I mean, this is more money than a, a HomePod and yeah. much more money than a HomePod Mini. And so these, this, these start to feel like they're in the camp of the gold... 24 karat gold Apple Watch. You know, this is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course it's not. Especially it's just not that. in late 2020, it's like, who, like, bad time. I, I yeah. can't afford them. Um, I mean, I ordered a pair to review. And so I'm almost positive my you review did? is going to be, I can't, I can't afford them. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a YouTuber and stuff. So I'm trying them. I like fully, fully intend on returning these. I will like I can't afford them, but I'm doing the trial period and returning them for that. So I just want to know what it is like because yeah, I'm convinced fair. that it is like home pods on your head. <laughs> and so if it was the price of two home pods, it's I, I gotta get that visual of holding them up to my face. I will also <laughs> say, like, I'm a musician, and so I can like distinctly remember being in my like van the blue arrow star and like hearing bass guitar for the first time because it was suddenly like I could separate the music and like understand those different parts. And so that made me a musician because I just appreciated the different types of instruments and that, that separation thing. And so that's what HomePod does out loud. That's what AirPods don't really do. Like they have some of it, but it's in a much more minimal way. And so I'm very curious what it's like because even, I, I don't know, it's always one of those things where I, I like the AirPods Pro are fantastic, but they're not comfortable. Like no, they they're just not. are not comfortable. Most Like when I put in the old AirPods, it's like, oh yeah, these float in your ears. They're AirPods, not just like cool headphones. And so I even have the little... Um, comply foam tips on my AirPods to like let them fit in my ears better instead of mm -hmm. the normal tips. And even then, not that great. And so I really am trying like all day long to wear my AirPods Pro for a situation that they're not really built for. Um, and I have desk headphones. I'm wearing them right now. Like these are like, in that same type of range for high quality like studio headphones basically so that I can properly hear my audio. But part of it is that I'm attached to my desk. I've got this right. cord right here. Um, and so it's like, I don't actually wear them a lot because just during the workday, I do walk around the space a little bit. And so I have been like, oh, the HomePod mini doesn't work on my desk. A, a normal HomePod is kind of wild on my desk. I can only keep it at maximum 15% or otherwise downstairs. It's going like with bass and stuff like that. Um, so it was kind of funny to be like, oh, this is the product that I would want. It's just more expensive than I can afford right now. And so right. I also, I think something that I, I know I'm always on my high horse or whatever it is, but just like <laughs> these, these are Siri capable. They're Siri headphones too. That's all is smart stuff that you can wear around the house. And the transparency thing I think is super interesting in terms of being able to hear your environment and fully block it out. Like, I don't know about you, but my furnace is broken. And so I'm running a space heater 24 seven and I hear that through my AirPods Pro all the time. And so actual silence does sound nice. Whether it's worth $500 to you probably depends on how you make money. But if it's like, if in the long run, 
this type of tool helps me focus in on my job and things like that, it would be worth it. Or just there's a lot of value in joy and music brings me joy. There's one video of somebody dancing at a festival and everybody joins in with him that like broke my heart and let music pour out of me and how it affects me. And now when I like see people thoroughly enjoying music, I get like overwhelmed with positive feelings too. And so I think music does have a lot of power that gets uncredited. And it's, if it's like the best possible experience that you could have, it sounds pretty awesome. It's again, though, $500 headphones in late 2020 is like, ugh. after all the Macs too, and all, everything it is like, Apple's like the new Macs are for you. These headphones aren't for you. Um, <laughs> so it's always a little odd. Yeah, the I'm uh, with optics you. there. And so I will have a review. Maybe I'll wear them next week. I guess you won't be here. So yeah, surprise. Uh, oh, spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we'll we'll talk about that at the end of the show. But sure. um, it's just for next week, folks. If you're in the chat and going, oh, oh no, no. He's, he's going away. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm Sorry. not going away. It's just for one week. Mean the <laughs> um, I will be excitedly watching that episode, though, because two of my favorite people will be coming together for that episode. Mm-hmm. So uh, it should be good. Um, <laughs> I, Matthew was like, ooh, yeah, you're one of them. <laughs> um, and then next, let's talk about Logitech launching... <sighs> There are very few companies who have successfully created a video doorbell for HomeKit. Um, as the, I think it was 9to5Mac who had an article out that was kind of talking about Logitech being the first to launch a video doorbell with HomeKit secure video support. Um, there was a company that did it before, but it was a company that's more for the, con, the not the consumer market, but the construction market. And so it was this very expensive camera that's supposed to be kind of bought in bulk and uh, is, you know, a a construction inclusion device. Whereas Logitech's new video doorbell is meant for the everyday person. Um, Once upon a time in a distant land, uh, it was August who was supposed to be creating the first video doorbell that offered HomeKit support just in general, not even HomeKit secure video support, but HomeKit support in general. And they never stinking did it. Um, And I don't know why that was. I don't know what happened there, but they never stinking did it. And so that was always uh, bothersome to me. But um, now Logitech is out with its video doorbell and it's an inexpensive in comparison to others in an, and in comparison to others it's an inexpensive option and i like that it is you know more within the the cost range uh uh rather than being you know super super expensive yeah, and logitech works. has blown me away with its um logitech circle cameras in the past um and it's other home kit devices, the Logitech pop and things like that. So I am, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, seeing this out in the world. I live in an apartment complex, um, in, in a, in a town home that has rules about what can and can't be on the outside of the property. So I'm not able to get one of these and install it, uh, at least mm-hmm. not permanently. Um, but Maybe this is something you would be willing to check out. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to... wiring. <laughs> I oh, don't have a I have a big old knocker from 100 years ago. So, dun, dun, yes. dun. also, this is not <laughs> not something I can use. But it was funny. I saw on Twitter someone was like, "This is the one to get," and I just was like, "Why?" And he's like, "Because it's the only one available in the U.S." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, <laughs> pretty straightforward." And it's like, "Yep, just that's your option right now." So, hopefully, we see some more of these, like you said, the August come soon. Uh, I, d- I don't hold your breath, people. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, I, can you tell I'm salty about it? I'm salty about it. <laughs> and then uh, a review of the Meros Smart Power Strip and Smart Plug uh, so that you can have uh, not just a, a plug that you plug into the wall, but also USB ports and a full-on power strip. 
this is from Mac Rumors, who has done a review of these Meros uh, devices. Now, mm -hmm. tell me about the because there's a bit of a complaint about the setup that was kind of frustrating. Yeah, yeah, it seems like I think this is part of. I think it comes backwards from the part where this costs thirty-five dollars for the power strip, or forty dollars, or the plug itself is cheaper. So Moras is kind of that budget brand, um, but it seems like they had a bunch of trouble getting it set up and moving it, all that jazz. But so it's, I think it's worth understanding that maybe some of those like conveniences are not there when you get a cheaper HomeKit product. But I still think it's interesting that these folks have. Um, just this type of power. I haven't seen anything like this for HomeKit besides the Eve one that's really fancy, has only three outlets and none of the USB ports. And so they've got four USB ports and four outlets if you want it all HomeKit compatible. Maybe you'll have to sit there for a few hours. You'll pay for it with your time <laughs> setting it all up. But once you do get it set up, it does seem pretty solid. And especially just being able to kind of monitor that many ports is like something that you can't do right now otherwise. So... And they've got um, international versions as well, which is cool. Usually that's not always the case. So they got EU, US, Australia, and France. Nice. Yep. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Oh, well, Google search has added 50 new 3D animals. Uh, so remember back a while ago, we done talked about how you could have some, uh, I believe it was insects mostly at the time. And by doing a Google search for 3D uh, AR animals, you could find a stag beetle, uh, maybe one of those ones that rolls around in the dung. And I think there was like a butterfly or something. But now... Uh, there are animals as well, including, <laughs> I do declare, a chihuahua. I am very excited about that. And for those of you who are all into cats uh, and, and talking to them with their meows, <laughs> there are cats as well. I'm, I'm going to have to check this out myself here. I wonder uh, if this only works on Android devices. It does say uh, you need to use the Google app iOS devices. Sorry, I spoke over you. You have to use the Google app. So that should show it in there, which is nice. But yeah, this is just kind of one of those fun things that I don't know about you, but I haven't used AR since I got a phone with LiDAR on it. <laughs> or I did the demo thing, but haven't tried it since then. But I think this is still just neat. I think seeing that stuff not like in person, but just kind of being able to make it at any scale is always nice and just kind of see up close. Like I want to play with this with my nephew because that kind of stuff does blow kids' minds. <laughs> Little guy. Oh, that's amazing. Hello. Ooh, I Hello. do like that he's in it. <laughs> it's virtually fitting him. <laughs> I wish you could hear it barking. It's making little barking sounds. That is cool. See, it's working better on your, maybe mine's a beta thing could be but yeah um there's a chihuahua <laughs> all right that you was, need a chihuahua uh, and the coffee yeah that was a lot of work to make that happen but i'm <laughs> glad i did because that was adorable <laughs> um so lots of animals if you want to see them in 3d uh including um you know like a sphinx cat and an ox and a doberman pincher and a coyote. And milk cow. <laughs> Otherwise known as a coyote, but here we call them coyotes. Um, all right. Let us move on before I keep doing that accent and annoy the crap out of people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, um, can we turn toothbrushing into a quiet moment of mindfulness? Uh, Colgate wants to. With the Hum toothbrush. Now, you may have seen an advertisement or nine about the Hum toothbrush, and that would not be uh, surprising. But what's kind of cool is that Hum is looking to partner with, uh, or is actually 
not looking to, but is partnering with Headspace and will uh, help you kind of use that period of time to, as you're brushing your teeth to be mindful as well. Um, two things here. Well, one thing here, and then I'll let Matthew kind of uh, dis- discuss this a little bit farther. <laughs> one thing that I think is important is that there was a recent study uh, for mindfulness and looking at meditation. And of course, we know that meditation is helpful and that there are different ways in which it is helpful, but kind of getting to the root of some actual outcomes and actual effects uh, is something that we continue to work on. And Mm -hmm. a recent study looked at areas of activity in the brain and discovered that mindfulness meditation actually reduces activity in the area of the brain related to self-blame. So when one blames themselves for different situations, a certain part of the brain will light up. And when these folks practice mindfulness meditation, that area of the brain lit up less after having practiced mindfulness meditation. So Mm. if you find yourself blaming yourself a lot... um, and uh, you know, second meditation. <laughs> that's the <laughs> exactly. best one. <laughs> yeah. Um, then th- I think that that's super cool. So I, I just, I think that's important because I think sometimes um, the sort of commercialization of mindfulness and meditation has gotten in the way of seeing the actual benefits, excuse me, mm-hmm. and goodness that uh, mindfulness and meditation can bring you. Um, and so I, I think it's important to talk about the true and actual effect that this can have. Uh, so I yeah, like I love data like that because to me it becomes logical then it's just like, Oh, okay. So I should just meditate like versus feeling like you should, and you don't know why, and it's not worth it. It's just like, Oh, it will prevent those specific things. A lot of times it's just like, Oh, okay, cool. Like I'll do that then. And I think that's one thing that. It's like when you don't have that reason, you are just like, I feel like I should. And everybody tells me I should. But I like I always turn on my car lights because I, I when I was 16, they were like, oh, yeah, even having your lights on during the day reduces your chance of getting in a crash by like 17 percent. And I was like, why would I not do that then always forever? Like <laughs> it just is very simple. So I agree. That's cool. And I think the the other part about this article that you you always know this, but um <laughs> it has it's basically like most people only brushes less less than 45 seconds and only 34% brush for two minutes or more. And so what? I think this is yeah, exactly. It's like the only average 34%? person brushes for 40. I lo- I always love that office quote when he's like, How long does it take <laughs> you to brush your teeth in the morning? I don't know, eight seconds. He's like, Wow, that's twice as long as me. <laughs> it's like, uh <laughs> um both of those. But I'd like the Oh. I think this is an interesting habit stacking type of thing too, because it's like you're already brushing your teeth, you're not doing anything. I have no idea how the like audio part of the mind space thing or the headspace thing works, because if you're brushing, you might not be able to hear. But I think just integrating it natively into that, you're already doing a self care routine, not like oh, I need to wake up in the morning and meditate every day. It's Now you can like just kind of brush your teeth and think about it a little bit. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I will say this is from Adweek. And so this it's a little bit like this could be cool. And we're doing this marketing type thing. But I do think it actually does make sense there. And is like one of the first kind of some electric toothbrush things that seems like it actually it does continue to add value on top. Not just like here's $100 for a toothbrush like having that data and having it be sort of a holistic thing, I think is nice. So that's, I'm glad to see smart toothbrushes evolve beyond what they were. Cause it has seemed sort of, it's like a huge trend. It is like, uh, like everybody has them, but I, I don't know. And I don't, I don't know. It's like, where else do you go from there? So maybe this type of stuff makes more sense. Also, I'm glad I don't, I haven't seen a single ad for this. So I, I don't know what you're watching that, Gives you ads. Well, I, just, I don't see Instagram. almost any ads. Uh, they know That's you're the smart saying. tech person, so because <laughs> I don't, wa- I don't watch any television that has ads. But yeah, Instagram is where um, I've seen it. 
None of these toothbrushes, though, that's the thing that annoys me is that I would love to use one of these smart toothbrushes, but none of them have the rotating head. They all do that pulsing thing, which from mm. all of the research that I've read, um, it, it suggests that that pulsing vibration is not as effective as the um, oscillating brush head, that that is the better method yeah. to clean your teeth. And so I wish they would make one that had that, but offered, uh, some of these smarts. And I guess, you know, f what is it? Um, uh, Oral B has one, but it's just, it's ridiculously priced in comparison to some of these that are more affordable, but maybe that's what it is. It's that that little motor makes all the difference. And so they're like, Oh yeah, we'll just make it vibrate. And that it will make people think that that's enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It all right. <laughs> um, so what this is, this is kind of a, a story of, that we've all, any of us who've ever used a fitness tracker, um, especially for me, an Apple watch, uh, have, have experienced where you get a fitness tracker of some sort and suddenly you are just very, uh, you get into the, the sort of closing your rings and doing that kind of thing. Um, the gamification of the, service of the the features can help you get into it. And so uh, Catherine Speller has written this article entitled, I wore a fitness tracker for a month and surprisingly, I got super into it. <laughs> uh, there is a bit of shock there, but no, it's um, not surprising to me. And I think, Matthew, you'd probably mm -hmm. argue not surprising to you, eh? Yeah, it's always, I always like to see stories like this just because there's always somebody who's discovering this for the first time. And to, it's also probably one of those things that's like, you should watch this show. Everybody should get a fitness tracker. And it's like, yeah, okay, whatever, but not really. And then when you actually get it, you can start to notice how those little moments add up to something bigger as opposed to now I'm going to run it. Like I think fitness plus, this is kind of an interesting contrast with something like that. That's specifically about exercise and losing weight versus or not losing weight, but depending on your goals, but it's mm -hmm. more so in the fitness realm versus health kind of and movement and things like that. Like I definitely know that the Apple watch still is really valuable for me because of the movement aspect beyond fitness and standing. And like, I know for sure times where I don't stand enough and I slowly integrated over the time, over the years, just like, I basically need to take at least two walks a day. Otherwise, I won't really get that stuff. And one really strong exercise in the morning doesn't make up for sitting at, on the couch the entire night and things like that. Um, so I think it's always just kind of worth checking in on yourself with that. And um, I interestingly, <laughs> I don't care about my rings anymore. And so that's something that I want to like get back. And I don't Me know. Too. It's totally like, I don't think I've thought about beating my goal in the last two months, even though yeah, like I same. do decently regularly, but I think the notifications haven't gotten to me as much. And so I'm hoping that maybe some of the fitness plus stuff, maybe they do have like a challenge thing that you can do. And so I think that tied with fitness plus seems more compelling as a reason to interact with somebody and kind of challenge each other. And, th and then that gives you a a reason beyond just like, oh, I should be healthy to exercise more, which is nice. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on the, uh, the, it not being something that I'm super into um, as much as I was and I wish that I was more into it. Uh, and I, I wanted to, because yeah, I tend to close my rings, but it is not by an active measure that I do so. And when I don't, I don't have any like, oh man, I wish I would have. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we need to take a quick break though because I need to tell you about Armor Lock. We talked about this. You may have heard about this if you watch Smart Tech today. It is the very, very cool NVMe SSD. That's solid state drive. Uh, of course, with, with this device, um, you can make sure that your data is protected. The privacy of your data, it's constantly being threatened. Imagine if your valuable media files or important documents were stolen and got into the wrong hands. People want to know 
that their content is safe now more than ever. G Technology gives you professional-grade storage solutions that empower studios, professional photographers, videographers, and editors to thrive in high-pressure creative environments. G Technology's ArmorLock encrypted NVMe SSD and app deliver high-grade data security with pro-grade performance that's super simple for anyone to use. It's easy to unlock with your phone, leveraging modern-day digital experiences. In fact, it's just like digital door locks or car keys or digital hotel keys. With Armor Lock, your phone is your key. You're not going to need to remember passwords or download software that slows everything down. You just open the Armor Lock app on your phone or your Mac, you tap the button to unlock, and off you go. Armor Lock's SSD is built to withstand the rigors of travel as well. Uh, so that way, if you're shipping it or you drop it, it's going to be okay because it's ultra rugged for max durability and reliability. IP67 dust and water resistant. And best of all, the SSD is equipped with high grade 256 bit AES XTS hardware encryption. So you know your data has the best protection out there. Now, Armor Lock leverages the biometric authentication that you already have on your phone. So it makes unlocking the drive a super frictionless experience. You're not going to have to compromise speed for security because that makes you not want to use it as much, right? So don't compromise that speed. Get both speed and security. Armor Lock gives you them, ensuring you get the high-grade security you deserve with the pro-grade speeds your workflow demands. Collaboration is key when working on productions or team projects. So Armor Lock lets you control who gets access to the drive, even if they're in a different location. You can easily authorize remote users prior to shipping the drive. And once it arrives, it's ready to unlock and use. Because they manufacture their own flash technology and SSDs, you can be confident that Armor Lock is built from the ground up with specifically selected elements to create the best, most consistent product experience. And by the way, they recently won the Consumer Innovation Award at the Flash Memory Summit. The last thing you need is leaked films and lost or stolen drives. Take control of your data privacy with G Technologies Armor Lock NVMe SSD. Go to getarmorlock.com to learn more and get yours today. That's get armorlock.com. My thanks, our thanks to Armorlock for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Alrighty, we have got quite a few bits, bobbles, bits, and I already said that, so I guess I'll say bobbles again, um, from folks to answer some questions uh, that they have sent in. And first, I'm going to answer, or I'm going to have Matthew answer one um, that came in that definitely was one that felt uh, more up your alley, Matthew. So Forrest from Australia asks... <laughs> Hi, gents. I have an automation to put uh, my phone in low power mode when I connect my Bluetooth headphones. There's one problem, though. I'm unable to work out how to set an automation to turn low power mode off when I disconnect my headphones. Any ideas to help a fella out before his brain explodes? Matthew, can you help Forrest stop his brain from exploding? <laughs> or do you have bad news for him? Uh, I have all half... Good news and bad news. Do you want the bad news first or the good news first? <laughs> uh, Forrest <laughs> says he wants the good news last and the bad news first. Um, bad news, <laughs> you can't do an automation that is set to trigger when Bluetooth disconnects. So my first reaction to this was like, yeah, you can totally just do that. And then I went in and I was like, oh, wait, this isn't an option because I was thinking of charging and not charging and they have open app and close app and all those kinds of things. But the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi ones and location ones all do have those other layers of limitation for, I think, security reasons where you can't necessarily have those things happen automatically. And it seems like the same type of thing for Bluetooth specifically. When you disconnect, you can't have an automation set off. Um, so you can't, it, it was like, you totally can have low power mode turn off using shortcuts and you could have my good news solution is something like some sort of shortcut to disconnect your headphones for you. So rather than just like, uh, I think it might be a little bit weird, but if you're 
if you just take off the headphones some, and turn them off, usually they'll disconnect. But if you have a shortcut that says set the playback destination from my headphones to the to current device and then turn off low power mode, you could have that happen for you. So now that iOS 14.3 is out, stick it on the home screen would be a great way to do it or a shortcuts widget. It is like ideally, though, you would have a disconnect from Bluetooth trigger and then that could manually you could set the shortcut after that. So I'm curious, I guess, Forrest, like, let me know on Twitter. Do you actually run this every time you connect your Bluetooth headphones? Because that's something that maybe it's the convenience factor of AirPods. To me, is like, I don't, I just put them in and out so much that I don't want to run a shortcut every time manually also. But I can see for more intentional Bluetooth headphone experiences, something like that. So it's not fully automatic, but you can have a shortcut to move the destination back and then turn off low power mode. Hmm. So okay. A little bit of a, a route or NFC tag or something like that too. Maybe you could have it on the headphones and smack the headphones with your phone or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just hit your phone in your head and it turns off. <laughs> um, All right. Okay. Harry uh, writes, um, Micah and Matthew, I have a particular problem. I'm trying to set up NFC Uh, an NFC tag to automatically connect the person scanning the tag to my guest network Wi-Fi. From my research, it sounds like it is much easier to set up on an Android device, but most of my friends and family are using iPhones. I know it can be done with QR codes, but I was hoping for an NFC solution. Thank you, Harry in upstate New York. Harry, you are right in saying that it is much easier to do on uh, Android. However, I've got good news. Uh, there's no bad news on this one. I've got good news for you. <laughs> and that is you can do this using an iPhone. Uh, you will need a more modern iPhone. I think it's what, iPhone 8 and beyond. Um, yeah. And if you want to do, if you want to actually use this app for creating NFC tags, then you're going to need an iPhone 10 and beyond. Um But with this uh, app that I'm going to show you here in a second, you will be able to create NFC tags that will have Wi-Fi information built into them. And then you can use uh, anybody who has an iPhone 8 or beyond can scan that NFC tag to uh, let them connect to the uh, Wi-Fi. So. Um, so as you can see, I've got my iPhone here and I've launched the app called NFC Tools. With this, you can read NFC tags, you can write NFC tags, um, or you can other NFC tags. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> that is for formatting the, the tags. Um, so what you would do is choose write and then you would choose add a record. And then you find down here at the bottom Wi-Fi network, you type in the information. Um, so... We would edit that Mm. to choose what uh, type of... You probably have WPA2 personal. um, If there's any encryption for it, maybe it's WEP. uh, Then you type in the name of your SSID and then the password for it and then OK. And then that adds the record. Um, So let me just do one really quick here. I'll just do a a fake one. WPA2 personal... um, AES encryption, we'll call it uh, STT, and the password is, of course, monkey123. Um, then we choose OK, and then we choose uh, write, and then it says, hey, OK, approach the NFC tag. You approach the NFC tag and you bop it. Um, don't twist it or pull it. you got to bop it, and then <laughs> it will write that to it, and then someone can bring their phone up close to that NFC tag after that, and it will pop up a little notification at the top saying, do you want to connect to this Wi-Fi network? And you can do that. That's awesome. So, yeah, it is possible, um, but yes, as you said, it's a little bit easier on Android devices. Um, although, as long as you have a modern uh, iOS device, it's pretty much the same, honestly. Yeah, yeah, this is cool. You can also like scan your NFC tags just to see the technology used for them. And I have a little one on the underside of my desk that it's like the shortcuts team had NFC tags at WWDC and I have some. So it's like, oh, they're N tag 213 compared to I have 215s. So I, I, I should look into more of any work particularly well with iPhone 
just in terms yeah. of like scanning faster or something like that, because that would be nice. Yeah, that's yeah, actually this really is good. Neat. Good question. Um, let's I gotta, see, I gotta try to. No, hold on. I'm just thinking. Brain, brain, do thought. Um, I should make a shortcut URL scheme on one of these, so it taps it and then runs a URL that runs a shortcut that you already have. That might work. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> uh, up next is <laughs> oh, go ahead. What, what's up? I'm just laughing at this feedback. <laughs> oh, from yeah. Dale. <laughs> yeah. So CNET's Dale Smith has written in. Um, you may remember not too long ago we talked about uh an article from CNET that is entitled Google Home Scheduling Tasks is New, Quirky, and Cool. Here's how to do it. And it was an article talking about how you can tell the lights to turn off, you know, in 10 minutes or, um, it, you know, I, I can't remember what the one was that I had, the example that I had given. But basically, you don't have to do everything right now. You can kind of set it to say, hey, I want you to do this thing in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, etc. But we had talked mm -hmm. about using a space heater and kind of uh, talked about how some uses for a space heater were a little silly. And so CNET's Dale Smith, the uh, person who wrote this article, wrote in and said this. I've been a fan of your podcast for a while now, so I'm more amused than anything that I caught some shade on your November 30th episode for my oh, CNET so article about Google Home's <laughs> new scheduling feature. To be honest, the thought of someone turning the heater on and leaving the room never even occurred to me. In fact, I personally use the feature and have set up similar timers using various combinations of smart home gear in the past for the exact opposite reason. So I don't accidentally leave a heater running should I happen to get up and mindlessly leave the room without turning it off. Also, I have a heater in my bedroom plugged into a 15 amp smart plug, which I want to turn itself off if I happen to fall asleep while it's running. Another safety benefit. Another reason I like timing my space heater usage is simply to cut down on utility costs. If I turn a heater on, I might not think to turn it off until well after I'm warm. And with a timer, either it will turn off and, realize, and I'll realize I'm comfortable and leave it. Or if I'm still chilly, I'll just turn it on for another cycle. 20 minutes seems to be the sweet spot. Yes, I know space heaters have thermostats, but they're notoriously wonky and feel I feel most people do like I do and just crank it up to 11 and leave it there. In any case, I appreciate the mention and the link in the show notes, and I'm flattered that you read the article and included it in your show. Next time I update that story, I'll be sure to revise the parts about tricking Google Home into thinking it's a light to stress that it's irresponsible to leave a heater running in an unoccupied room. <laughs> I'm low-key cracking up that I never once considered that use case scenario. Uh, CNET's Dale Smith, I do thank you for writing in and for clarifying that you, truly wise one, were not ever in yeah, the business of, of recommending that you leave it running, but instead as a way to turn it off afterwards. That's smart. This is awesome. I love, I love hearing, I don't know. It's always like when you do a podcast, it seems like nobody actually listens. And so it is always fascinating when it's like the person who I quoted in the thing was like, Hey, I was listening to that. Um, also, it's like, I need that. I run my, I leave my space heater on all the time and it's, I'll be downstairs in here, like through the floor and stuff like that. So I definitely will be using this. And I like also like turning it off when I know that I'm going to leave. Like that's great stuff. It's got the little Logitech or I don't remember. No, Lenovo thing, um, smart clock. And so maybe I'll set up my thing with that to turn off my space heater, but not on. <laughs> Thanks, Dale. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Um, and the last one comes from Dave. Dave writes in to say, hey, are you aware of any HomeKit compatible smart plugs that will return to their previous state on or off once power is restored after an outage? I have several Belkin Waymo plugs, including the most recent model, but if the power goes out, they will always be in an off state once power is restored. Dave, um, you know, I thought about this and I have a, a sneaking suspicion that this is probably a safety feature. Um, yeah, same thing. That they are always off should the power be cut off. Um, 
the idea is that, you know, if you have a power outage, there's a good reason for it and for the uh, plug to turn back on after that power outage, uh, you could end up getting a surge, especially if you're having, you know, the power turn on and off uh, afterwards. So, no, I don't know of any that will return to the on state uh, upon a power outage taking place. Um, but I would yeah. argue that's a really good thing. It's like, I just imagine the same thing from the CNET article. It's like, if you set the light or the outlet as the light, but I think, I know at least for Hue, that was a thing for a while where if you lost power, all of the lights would just turn back on. And even if they were off and that was absurd because it's like, if you lose power in the middle of the night, all your lights suddenly turn on and you're just like blinded. Um, but I think that's all handled through Hue and stuff. So you wouldn't, I don't think you could do it in the same, I don't think you can change the device type in the same way and have it behave differently. That's sort of a home kit trick, I guess there, but yeah, same thing. You don't want your space heater to come on in the middle of the night and you don't notice. And then bad news. So kind of glad it's like, I'm, I'm curious what his specific use case was for this, why he wanted it to turn back on because sometimes it could be legit, but maybe there's some sort of, yeah, it's like when it's turned off, maybe there's an automation that you could set so it could turn it back on automatically if it's supposed to always be on, but I'm not sure. Definitely be careful with that one. Agreed. Cool. Uh, uh, all right. Let us, uh, let me tell you about another awesome sponsor today who continue to give me a good night's sleep. Yes, this episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Casper. By now, you've certainly heard of Casper. And no, I don't mean the friendly ghost. I definitely mean the very awesome Casper. You know the sleep company with outrageously comfortable products at not so outrageous prices. From award-winning mattresses to pillows and sheets and duvets, Casper transforms the way we sleep one snooze at a time. They've got bedding. They've got bed frames. They've even got a dadgum dog bed. Casper has everything you need to build the bed of your dreams, like I have. Also, that's a pun. Sleep pun. Ha! Huh. Every Casper mattress is designed with a system to react and adapt to your body all night long. Inside, precisely 1,501 perforations create a cooling system that's so effective, you won't be awake to notice. Only Casper mattresses are made with 86 supportive gel pods to align your spine and eliminate aches and pains. Altogether, it's the cooling, supportive comfort you need for the most refreshed feeling come morning. Good golly, from the moment I unboxed my Casper and it took that first breath of fresh air to this morning when I woke up after having slept on my Casper, I just Love it. I love my Casper mattress so much. I've got Casper sheets, Casper pillows. I've got it all. And that's because not only is it, uh, has it been fantastic, but it's also easily transportable. And I've been one to move from place to place to place. And being able to bring along my Casper with no problem has been fantastic. Uh, with over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars across Casper, Amazon, and Google, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. And you out there can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep on a trial. And Casper also offers free shipping and painless returns to the U.S. and Canada. And now with 0% APR financing options, it's even easier to try a Casper mattress. Go to casper.com slash STT and use code STT for $100 off select mattresses. That's code STT for $100 off select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply. See casper.com slash terms for those. All righty, Matthew, tell us about your pick, parenthesis, S, closed parenthesis, of the week. Yes, this is from developer Frederick Riedel, right, Rydell? I'm not sure. Um, but he's got an app called Homey, which is H-O-M-I-E. It's a menu bar app for HomeKit. So this lets you set up just a little menu bar utility on a Mac and then set up access to your HomeKit scenes and things like that and keyboard shortcuts. This is awesome. Like this guy also makes another app that's called One Second Every Day, where 
or uh, not one second every day. It's called, what is it? Where'd it go? Uh, one second. And it lets you use shortcuts automation to when you open an app, it basically has you like, are you sure that you want to use this app just for one second and then can kind of take you back out of it. And so it's kind of a, kind of a clever hack for shortcuts type users there, but that one is kind of an interesting way to have that mindfulness. I think it might be built out of the whole thing where when you would open into an app, it would take you into shortcuts first and ports you into having that little breath there. So I think it's kind of an interesting awareness thing there, but the homie for Mac also seems pretty useful. Can just stick it up there. It seems, it's like, how does this not exist? How does Apple's thing not have a home kit integration in the menu bar and things like that? But hey, we got it anyways. So check it out. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to, I definitely getting homey because I often will launch um, the home app on my Mac instead of just uh and if it was just in the menu bar i could make those quick adjustments uh very easily so that's super cool i'm definitely gonna mm -hmm. check that out for sure uh it is and, worth mentioning it's uh got a subscription thing so it is free to download but it's like 15 bucks a year so i think this is a super independent developer though so if you are interested in seeing more apps like this you should definitely pay them for it yeah, it's uh, it's it's five dollars and fifty cents a year, and if you want to just pay oh, one yeah. time and never have to upgrade, it's fourteen ninety nine for a one time purchase. Um, what you get with the upgrade, it's to make use of favorites, automation, and keyboard shortcuts. Um, but the free version does have access to uh, the basic features, so you can automate scenes, so you can trigger scenes from uh, different events. And, um, you know, so like maybe unlocking your computer will automatically turn on your desk light. That's very cool. Yeah, um, I do this stuff with shortcuts already, but I'm more native and kind of just like local to the system version makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a, I love apps like this where, I don't know, I mean, it's like it clearly just haven't, hasn't gotten its day of people knowing about it and hearing about it. But this thing is so cool. And it's like, why didn't this exist before? So definitely get it. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you have those, why didn't, why wasn't this available before? You, you know, you've got a good app. Um, mine is one that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was, I believe on sale and there was a review of it. Oh, nice. Um, this is the Meros MSL 320, which is the 32.8 foot uh, light strip. <laughs> and so, so it's long. it's a whole heck of a lot of light strip, uh, but it is HomeKit enabled and it comes with, I think, so I'm going to show you, you know, it's still my pick of the week because you get so much here. Um, of course, here's your normal, you know, power cable and that jazz. Um here, I'll show you, though, my one complaint that I have about this and the module that has the, you know, the Wi-Fi chip inside of it that connects to the power strip. Uh, let me cover my HomeKit code. As you see, there's a cable into which you plug the, um, the, the power adapter. And then from that comes a cord. Uh that has two, uh, two plugs on it. And that is because you are meant to plug one into, uh, one of the, uh, what am I trying to say? One of the strips into one cord and one of the strips into the other. And that bugs me a little bit because I saw it as a one strip that you can just go all yeah. the way across as opposed to... Like an extension to, cord. Exactly. As opposed to this where you have to kind of put this in the middle and split the cord yeah. uh, to either so side. It's got to be plugged in in the center, basically. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> the simpler way to put it. You have to plug it in in the center, center, and I was not too big a fan of that idea. Um, mm. But that said, um, there are two packages, each having you know the light strips inside, and they come kind of wound up, which is really nice, uh, so that it's it's very easy to uh, apply them as you would like to. And I believe, yeah, the back has a 3M glue 
So you can peel and stick these. You know, you don't, there are these little cable clips that you can use. So if you don't want to peel and stick them, this is what I'll end up using. Um, I'm not a, a peel and s stick the whole thing kind of person uh, based on where I want to put them and the fact that I want to use them again in the future should I leave this place. Um, but I do like that the LED strips are rather large. Um, so that's very impressive that you get uh, RGB LEDs and they are, uh, and, and I think it's red and blue and then the green one is that bigger one. So red and blue is a little bit um, darker. Or, I mean, the, the LEDs are a little bit smaller and the green is uh, bigger. And these are... Uh, each one of them, of course, is half of that 32.8 feet. Um, so you can go across. And it says that uh, they can't exceed five meters uh, when used in sort of a single circuit. So from that point on, you'd need to get another adapter, you know, if you wanted to get another one. But... Oh, wait, so they can be chained? It, it says like. the LED strips must not exceed five meters when used in a DC circuit. So maybe they can be chained. You know what? I'll have to try that. That I have not tried because I um, it's taken me a while to get my holiday decorations all set up, I'll be honest with you. Um, and this is kind of the, the last uh, bit of well, it. Five meters, I guess, is that's why it's in two strips. It's about 16 feet, which is each of them is 16 feet. So it oh, probably okay. can't. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Did you... Should, yeah. Wait, I don't remember. Did you get a chance to see how bright it is? Because I think that's yes, what we were I discussing. Yes, I did try is. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is it is about as bright as um I can't now I can't think of the brand. Um it's not as bright as LifeX. It's not as bright as Philips Hue. It's about as bright as the Eve light strip. Um, mm -hmm. So not super, super bright, but not as dark as I was worried it would be. Um, yeah, like barely and, works. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, they also have included, which I like, uh, two of these little fasteners, which it's kind of hard to see, but essentially these have little uh, clamps. And so you can cut the strips uh. as you need and then fasten them together using these little clips. Um, so if you, you know you need to make adjustments, maybe you want to go uh, around a corner or something like that, you can use that at the corner uh, to help facilitate the connection. Or if you've got a spot where you, you, know, you need to uh, clip and, and connect, then you can do that. So yeah, there's it includes quite a bit to make sure that you can get the setup uh, all together as you'd like. And I think that that was really well. And then I think the most surprising thing is the price at just 22 bucks, okay. um, 32.8 feet of LED light strip and home kit support is uh, quite impressive. Yeah, that's good. How was the home kit stuff? Is it, I mean, I it's just like every other one. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> with, yeah, that, that, I think that that's the best thing about this is that in fact, Maras is like, you don't don't try to find an app. Don't do anything like that. You launch the home app and use the QR code that we gave you on the outside, silly. Uh, don't don't fool around with anything else. Just do it all right in the home app. So they really have kind of, um, in a good way, I feel, uh, punted the management to Apple's home app uh, instead of making you rely on their app and and. Uh, the f features that are available in something like that. So yeah, I quite, nice. I'm quite impressed crazy, with it for the price, especially yeah. how much light strip you get. Um, and all of the necessary components too the, the things to hang it on the wall and, um, the proper adapters and stuff like that. So, uh, that's the Meros MSL 320 <laughs> for 22 bucks on Amazon. Nice. Terrible name, but... Terrible, terrible name. Slide strip, <laughs> I think, is yes. the main one. Uh, folks, if you have questions for us, um, if you have, actually, let me say now, so I will be out uh, on Monday 
which of course is when we record Smart Tech Today. And uh, the incredible, the super awesome Rosemary Orchard will be filling in for me on that show. Uh, so Matthew and Rosemary will be doing that episode of Smart Tech Today. Uh, so if you've got questions for Matthew and Rosemary, uh, two automation experts and two smart home experts um, and two just very good at, at sort of uh, the, the conditional type stuff. So now is the time to get in your questions about how to make use of those technologies. And it doesn't have to just be iOS focused uh, because much of that same conditional stuff can be attributed or can be applied to, you know, if this, then that yeah. services. She's all in Zapier too. She, yeah, Zapier. Rose does the that. Automators podcast if people don't know. And with David Sparks, who did Mac, uh, Mac Power users or has been doing it for years and years. So, She's an awesome person and super smart. We're specifically, yeah, going to try to focus on automation a little bit because usually there's a lot more hardware here. And Rose is, Rose is one of those peoples where I look at what she's doing and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. if you say that about me, it's like she's, she's who I'm looking up to. So, <laughs> um, And I'm glad so you'll def- get a break off too. <laughs> yeah, a little, little bit of a break, which is nice because this is, this is a... F- like first, oh, anyway, it's been a tough year or something. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Um, so yes, uh, I won't be here, but it will be a fantastic episode. So email s t t s t t at twit tv. Smart tech today at twit tv. S t t at twit tv. Um, of course, we record the show live every Monday, so you can tune in at eleven a.m. Pacific. That's two p.m. Eastern. Um, so you definitely should tune in this coming Monday. Uh, twit tv slash live. But you can also get the show when it's ready. Don't even have to worry about uh, tuning in live. And you do that by going to twit.tv slash STT and clicking to subscribe in audio and video formats. Uh, we're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all the different podcast platforms, YouTube, etc. So you can get to our content through that way. That's the best way to do it. Uh, and... If folks want to follow you online and see all the great work you're doing, Matthew, where do they go to do that? Uh, you can go to matthewcassinelli.com, and that's C-A-S-S-I-N-E-L-L-I. Um, and I'm starting to put posts up for my newsletter that I'm sending out every week, too, so you can always go back and check it there. But got What's New in Shortcuts issue 14 out right now, all about that home screen update, and I've got wallpaper shortcuts linked and stuff like that. Definitely awesome. the best way to stay up with me and shortcut stuff right now, for sure. Awesome, awesome. Um, I am at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social media networks. Um, and you can head to chihuahua.coffee, that's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links and QR codes to the different places I exist online. Sadly, they're not NFC tags, but they are QR codes. So you can get there quickly. Uh, yeah, I guess that is goodbye. So it's just time to say goodnight to all of your smart systems. I'll see you next year, Michael. I said say goodnight again. I did it again. It's <laughs> not goodnight. It's goodbye or good eve yeah, after you changed the time like six months ago. Like <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mike needs to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ed's bye. Easy. I'm Jason Howell, host of Tech News Weekly here on Twit.tv, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Each and every week, we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. It could be journalists writing amazing tech stories. It could be experts. It could be the sources of the stories themselves, developers, you name it. We bring them onto the show, and we talk to them about why their story is resonating with the world. You can watch and subscribe by going to twit.tv slash TNW. Make sure you do that and you won't miss a single episode. We'll see you there.